Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, a mostly scripted podcast that tries to make history more fun and accessible. My kind of history is the unpopular stuff. Disease, death, and destruction. I like learning about all things bloody, gross, mysterious, and weird. I want to start with a quick shout out to my newest cannibal patron over on the AF Out Patreon, Joaquin. I'm so glad you love the show and thank you so much for your support. Keep an ear out for your name popping up somewhere in today's episode. Thanks for everything. Now, if you want to be cool like Joaquin and you, you want to support me, you can find the show on Patreon, A Popular History of Unpopular Things. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, so click subscribe below, leave a like, leave a comment. It all helps really make this channel grow, and I appreciate any love and support. So, in early July... 1816, a French frigate called the Meduse ran aground on a sand bake in the Bay of Arguin, off the coast of today's Mauritania, Western Africa. It's a French ship, but since I don't do French, which means today is probably going to be a struggle for me, I'm just going to use the anglicized version, the Medusa. The Medusa's mission was to colonize Senegal. In the years after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Age, the newly restored monarchy under King Louis XVIII was interested in settling on the West African coast to take advantage of commodity trade. Things like cotton, cocoa, sugarcane, and gum from the acacia tree. Acacia? Acacia tree. Used in medicines, inks, dyes, sweets, stuff like that. Acacia gum. And because this is an AFOUT episode, you know that this goes horribly, horribly wrong. Beyond just a normal shipwreck, too. I mean, which is bad enough. You'll see. Now, as we normally do here on the AF Out podcast, we will start with the historical context. What was happening in the world that explains why a French ship wanted to settle in West Africa? Why that moment in French history and in time? Why Senegal? And why Africa in general? There's actually quite a lot of context to explore here, so we'll go through that first before we get into the shipwreck itself and all the tragedies that befell the 400 people on board the Medusa. And get ready, because my favorite thing happens. Cannibalism. Yep, that's right, AFOUT fans. There were moments when things got so bad and the situation was so dire that they had to turn to cannibalism to survive. So, batten down the hatches, historians, and let's get started. So first, let's talk big picture. Why were the French heading to Africa in the early 19th century? Well, for those of you who remember anything about the 1800s, perhaps your brain immediately goes to the Atlantic slave trade, right? That was a pretty big thing that involved ships and sailing and colonizing other countries. And to that, I say, kind of. The infrastructure of trade between Europe, Africa, and America was still there, and while the slave trade was still a thing, the French slave trade was starting to wind down a little bit by this point. Not the existence of slaves, but the buying and selling of enslaved peoples. But it's important to note, again, the slave trade was the primary reason why Europe became, Af became interested in Africa in the first place, at least from this colonial imperial perspective. So let's rewind a little further still. Europe first started exploring the African coastline by ship during the Age of Exploration. And after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which I'm not going to get into again because I feel like I've done that so many times by this point, Europeans were eager to find new trade routes by sea to Asia instead of going by land. The Portuguese were the first to find the Indian Ocean by sailing around Africa, and after that point, Europeans started setting up trade posts on African coastlines. At the same time, the Spanish headed west to what they later realized were the Americas, and then Portugal, and England, and France, and the Netherlands followed suit. They built up colonies there as well, right? I mean, it's why the U.S. exists as an English-speaking nation, because we were colonized by the English. So now we've got Europe engaging in trade in colonies in Africa and the Americas, and it was the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. North America was well suited to growing things like rice and indigo and tobacco. I mentioned this in my Jamestown episode. Pocahontas' husband, John Rolfe, got that tobacco plantation thing started in Virginia, right? And it was really successful for them. But in the Caribbean and South America, it was mostly about sugarcane. It grew a lot more and it was 
a good chunk of the world's first real taste of sweetness and sugar. But they did also grow tobacco, and then there were also gold and silver mines. Essentially, my bigger point here is that raw materials came from the Americas and were shipped back over to Europe to be turned into manufactured goods. So how did Africa factor into all of this? Well, Africa also provided Europeans with raw materials, but there was one commodity above the rest that the Europeans wanted from their trading posts in West and Central Africa, human beings. The enslavement of Africa's depopulated towns and entire empires along the West and Central African coasts. And it wasn't just a case of Europeans stealing Africans in the middle of the night, men, women, and children absconding with them to head across the ocean. I mean, sure, that did happen occasionally. But the slave trade was a whole economy that typically we would see stronger African nations and kingdoms and empires engaging in by taking over smaller ones and selling the people off to slavery. I'm not going to get into all of that today, but maybe another episode. So throughout the early modern era, global trade was centered over the Atlantic. Sure, trade in the East was still a thing, but the money coming out of the Americas really dominated the global economy. And France made a good chunk of that money off of all of this trade, primarily with Haiti, their sugar plantation colony, essentially, which allowed them to do things like, I don't know, attack the English? settle colonies in the Americas, engage in imperialism throughout the world. But things started to change in France with the French Revolution. The cost of various French wars against the Dutch, against the English, helping the Americans during our revolution, it essentially bankrupted the French government. It also didn't help the French elite really like to party, despite the common people starving in the streets. Long story short and simplified, the French rebelled against their monarchy, cut off Louis XVI's head with a, with a guillotine, cut off his wife Marie Antoinette's head, and established a republic. But the republic didn't last very long because it was an absolute hot mess, and this is when Napoleon takes over. Now, under Napoleon, the French saw their territory grow as an empire in Europe. Napoleon was around from about 1799 until 1814 when he was exiled to Elba in the Mediterranean Sea. The French brought monarchy back with Louis XVIII, which was the brother of the beheaded king, Louis XVI, but Louis XVIII was pretty unpopular, so Napoleon escaped from Elba and attempted a coup to regain power. It only lasted 100 days before he saw the writing on the wall and decided to flee, but he ended up surrendering and being exiled to St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic. It's kind of like right between South America and Africa, and he died there. Why am I telling you all this? Well, our ship, the Medusa, was mired in all of that political tension. So you've got those in France who were loyal to the monarchy and Louis XVIII, or maybe more generically just his family line, the Bourbons. And then you've got those who were either pro-Napoleon or just anti-Bourbon, anti-monarchy. And that political tension, present in France, was also present on board the Medusa as the newly instated monarchy decided to refocus its efforts on colonizing West Africa, engage in trade, and boost its economy again after all of the chaos that it just endured. They needed to refill their treasury, right? They were pretty broke. But why Senegal? Well, the 1783 Peace of Paris, which ended the American Revolutionary War, divvied up a lot of land. Not only were the British to leave their American colonies, so hello to the United States now, but France also got a bunch of surrendered British colonies and lands, and Senegal was part of that package. So it was a relatively new area for the French where they could explore and settle and trade. And that context very much factors into what happened and why the ship wrecked in the first place. And that's why I think context is super, super important in history. Without the basics of knowing why the French were heading to Africa or what the political tensions were, then the shipwreck itself is just another shipwreck. But knowing all of the context makes the story juicier. And I don't just mean the cannibalism part. Because from the very beginning, with the very, very political appointment of the ship's captain, the whole expedition was doomed. The man chosen to captain the ship was, okay, bear with me, Hugues de Roy de Chamaray. I think I did okay. Now, to be fair, Chamaray did have some experience at sea. As a midshipman, 
in 1779 during the American Revolutionary War, and then again as captain of a transport ship right before the French Rev. So about a quarter of a century before the expedition to Senegal. Definitely the guy you want in charge of a fleet of ships convoying to the African coast. They should have gone with literally anybody else. So why this guy then, right? Like if, if he were a bit rusty, if he was a bit rusty, why was he chosen? Well, my friends, that's where the political context comes into play. He was a loyalist. This was a political appointment. He came from an old bourgeoisie family with ties to the Bourbon monarchy. So once Louis XVIII came back into power, he was given the job of captaining this mission to Senegal, not because he was a great sailor, but because he knew people in the right places. And let me just put this out there right now. He was vastly incompetent, <laughs> but more on that in a bit. Now, because this trip to Senegal is happening just after Napoleon's Hundred Days and his second exile, some of the men joined the expedition to get away from the political chaos, or because they were upset that the revolution had essentially failed and the monarchy was back. Some joined because they wanted to support the monarchy on this mission. So it was a real mishmash of people heading to West Africa. It was a new opportunity for some, a fresh start for others, maybe some distance from the tensions back home in France. And it's important to note as well that it wasn't just sailors on board. This was a settlement expedition, so there were men and women of varying jobs and social classes. And in fact, of the 400 people on board the Medusa, 166 of them were officers and crew. 61 were passengers, 10 were artillerymen, 161 were soldiers from two different companies of the African battalion, and then there were two soldiers' wives. So we've got a good mix in there. Sailors, settlers, protection. And this was just on the Medusa. There was a whole convoy of ships heading down there. To make things more complicated, the trip itself was fraught with danger. It was bad enough having a substandard captain who was basically just a political appointee, but the area was just not well mapped out. The waters were treacherous and peppered with sandbanks. Map makers didn't really have any accurate data to share. And it was a fact that they were laid on the maps themselves. It wasn't a big secret. They, just, they would be like, we don't know about this area. Good luck. Now, there were some men that Sean Murray was supposed to speak to, men with actual experience and advice, but the captain was above speaking to them and properly learning about the dangers, I guess. Like, what even is this guy? And with the winds and the weather patterns, it was recommended to arrive on the African coast in November so that they could properly acclimatize before the June to October rainy season hit. The expedition left in June. But to be fair, this wasn't actually Chamaray's choice. It's when they were told to leave by the government, so I can't blame him for that one. But it does remind me a lot of the warning that the Donner Party got before their fateful and deadly trip out west. Get there before the snows arrive or you're going to be stuck there. But they thought they knew better, and they figured they used some shortcuts to make up the time, so leaving later would be okay. But as we all know, that didn't turn out so well. Go listen to that one if you haven't already. That's my first episode. So anyways, the incompetent Shaw Murray and his politically divided crew arrived on the coast of Africa during the rainy season with incomplete maps. There were some on board that knew better, but because of the tense political situation, they weren't able to get a word in edgewise. And as a result of this combination of factors, the Medusa hit the Argon Sandbank off the coast of today's Mauritania on July 2nd, 1816. So first things first with a ship that runs aground. Can we wait for the tide and get it off the sandbank? Well, yeah, I, I, if it's not too badly beached, you, you can do that. And they certainly tried. Sailors with more experience than the captain attempted to use what's called a kedge anchor to free themselves. A kedge anchor is a white late, white late. <laughs> a kedge anchor is a lightweight secondary anchor, usually smaller than the main one, and they come in handy when you're trying to change the ship's position, right? Dig nicely into the vegetation under, under the under water on the ocean floor, and it can help swing the boat around. And in the case of the Medusa, the crew were able to do this. They managed to reposition the grounded boat so that only the stern, or the rear of the ship, was touching the sandbank. But the boat was still too heavy, and the men on board, with actual sailing experience, were not permitted to throw extra stuff off the boat to help lighten the load and get it to sail. So, unfortunately, this plan didn't work. 
Seeing the writing on the wall, some of the crew got to work building a raft of sorts to help ferry people to the shore. But this isn't your Jack and Rose from Titanic type of raft. And by the way, I am adamant that Rose could have made room for Jack, and I will die on that hill. No. This raft, the Medusa's raft, was approximately 65 feet by 21 feet, give or take a few feet there. The idea was for smaller boats to tow the raft to shore with supplies and people, and then they would all carry that stuff and go to Senegal by foot. Mm-hmm, that was the plan. Now, it's a good thing they got to work on this backup plan so quickly because a few strong waves, a few nights later, split the Medusa's keel in two. And you need the keel because it helps keep the ship stable and provide structure and resistance to waves and the wind. You're not, you're not sailing without a keel, right? And then the hull of the ship started to break apart anyway. A couple of hours later, the Medusa started taking on water. And soon enough, the order was given to evacuate. Not by the captain, mind you, but by the governor who would be in charge of the new Senegal colony, Governor Schmaltz. So everyone piled into either a boat or on the raft, depending on their rank and their class, really, and they fled the ship. Typically, higher ranks got the boats, lower ranks got the raft, right? Now, the raft was overloaded. There was too much stuff and too many people on it, and it was sinking up to two feet in some places. So they had to chuck a bunch of provisions in the water, which is really unfortunate because in a survival situation, you need as many provisions as you can get. Chamere left his ship too, before everyone else had gotten off, which he really wasn't supposed to do. And just to add insult to injury, a non-commissioned officer named Petit told him as he fled his vessel, quote, Since you are leaving us, at least give us the pleasure, if you reach France, of giving our families the news. End quote. Ouch. Sixty-four men were still on the Medusa after the captain, the boats, and the raft set off for the coast. And just to give you an idea of how some of these men felt about being ditched by their captain, one attempted to shoot Chamere with his rifle, but another fought him and the shot missed. More were eventually rescued, and only 17 were left behind. They chose to stay on their sinking ship and wait for help instead of being cast out into the unknown. So this raft that I'm talking about was heavy. So heavy, in fact, that the boats that were meant to be towing it to shore, right? They were supposed to be pulling it off to the coast. They were instead being pulled out to sea with the raft because of tides and currents. Some of the boats were more packed than others. And here's where more political and class divisions come into play. The governor's boat had some room, but he didn't want the common rabble on board with him. And then a lieutenant on the governor's boat decided that they didn't want to tow the raft anymore, lest they be pulled out to sea. So they cut the towing line and abandoned the raft. And it wasn't an accident. There were several hatchet blows, one after another, until the rope was split. And I really like how Jonathan Miles puts it in his book, The Wreck of the Medusa. So I'm going to quote him here, quote, after a few minutes, the cries from the raft died down as the silence of apprehension settled on its ill-fated occupants. The half-submerged structure, void of sails, oars, ropes, anchors, instruments, and charts, was abandoned, ungovernable, in the middle of the sea. End quote. Yikes. So the raft is going to have a bad time, but what if the boats? Some of the boats made it to land and struggled to find drinking water, most of the boats decided to stay on the water, they fearing the locals, but eventually they had to come to shore anyway because of the lack of supplies. So what exactly did they fear? Well, the indigenous. The French and Europeans more broadly were terrified of the existence of cannibal tribes and assumed that all African peoples were cannibals. Here's a source from a contemporary German doctor, George Henrik von Langsdorff, which helps illustrate the prejudice and fear that Europeans had about so-called African cannibals. Quote, There have been, and are still, people who feed upon human flesh merely on account of its delicacy, and as the height of indulgence. These nations not only eat the prisoners they take in war, but their own wives and children. They even buy and sell human flesh publicly. White men, Englishmen are preferable to Frenchmen. The flush of young girls and women, particularly of newborn children, far exceeds in delicacy that of the finest youths or grown men. Finally, they tell us that the inside of the hand and the sole of the foot are the nicest parts of the human body. End quote. <laughs> 
okay. You know what? With that last part right there, that tells me that this whole source is garbage and made of nonsense. All right? I mean, come on now. Who says that the palm of your hand or the sole of your foot is the best part to eat? What cannibal has ever been like, yeah, give me that tough, leathery foot meat, please? Come on now. American serial killer and cannibal Albert Fish made it very clear that it is the fatty, juicy parts that taste the best. Soles of the feet? Come on now. Weak. My point here is that the Europeans were the ones afraid of being cannibalized by the Africans, and not just in this one instance, but over this whole period of time. In reality, it was just a way of othering the non-white populations, dehumanizing them, and justifying European colonization and imperialism of both American and African land. More on that in another episode when I eventually get to the Belgian Congo. I, I will get there eventually. I also kind of want to do one on the decimation of New World populations with the arrival in the Spanish, and the Portuguese, and smallpox. We'll see. You know, I like a good disease story. Sorry. You know, I can't help a tangent. <laughs> anyway, those that made it to shore never encountered cannibals because there weren't any there. And not everyone survived getting to shore anyway. One guy had his legs smashed up on the rocks and he died from either heat exposure or dehydration. He got left behind, right? This shore party, after a few difficult days, later saw another one of the ships in the original convoy named the Argus, which had arrived safely in Senegal. It left the group with plenty of provisions and went out in search of the Medusa and more of the survivors of the wreck. These provisions were enough to keep the group going, and don't get me wrong, their walk down to where they were supposed to go was fraught with danger and fear and chaos and delirium, but in the end, 80 survivors made it to their destination after three days in a lifeboat and five days marching through the coastal desert. There were other groups from other boats, and most made it to St. Louis alive. That was the name of the place they were going in Senegal, the colony they were trying to create. And this included Governor Schmaltz and our ineffectual captain, Sean Murray. But I don't want to focus on them right now. I want to talk about what happened to those on board the raft, abandoned by the boats meant to tow it to shore, left adrift and without supplies or means of getting help. When the raft was abandoned by the boats, there were 147 people on board including the surgeon Henry Savine and a geographical engineer named Alexander Couriard. It was almost all men, just one woman on the raft. The most senior naval position on the raft was a midshipman, which is the lowest ranking officer. The higher officers, and indeed most of the crew, had all secured places on the boats. So what was left on the raft was a mixed bag of people and all sorts of occupations, not too much in the way of sailors. There were also some mercenaries, some captives, and some ex-convicts on board, which you can imagine only made things more stressful for everyone involved, and it was also super clear to everyone on the raft that they had been abandoned by the rest. So, tensions are high. The lieutenant who cut the rope from the governor's boat promised that there was a compass, charts, and an anchor on board the raft. So when the shock turned to rage and anger, and then determination to survive and make them pay, the rafters started looking for those crucial instruments. But of course, they weren't actually on board. One guy did happen to have a compass in his pocket, but when he went to go hand it over, it slipped from his hand and fell between a crack in the raft and sank. Because of course it did. The surgeon, Henry Savine, ended up becoming the de facto leader of the raft since the midshipman had a leg injury before the Medusa even sank, and he couldn't put any weight on it. So the first thing that the surgeon had all the men do was erect a mast and a small sail with whatever they could use. They didn't have a compass though, so navigation was definitely a lot more difficult. And the raft also didn't have a rudder, so they couldn't steer it anyways. They were essentially just at the mercy of the winds and the waves and the ocean. It didn't take long for food and liquid provisions to be consumed. After all, there were 147 people crammed onto a 65 by 21 foot raft. And also keep in mind, it is just a flat raft, just a big old rectangle. So people were constantly being swept off by the wind and the waves, and they had to latch themselves onto whatever they could with ropes so they wouldn't fall overboard. 
And in the chaos, people were crushed and mangled between the masts when the waves hurled the raft and its inhabitants all around. Others started dying from injuries sustained from the wreck and in the panic to get off the ship. Some just slipped off the raft and sank. After the first night, over a dozen people had died. A few purposefully jumped off the raft to just end their suffering. Some got crushed in a stampede of people trying to help balance the thing as it bobbed around. It was a pretty deadly first couple of days. At some point, some of the soldiers on board the raft decided, well, we're going to die, so let's get drunk. So they popped open a cask of wine, which was now filling up with seawater thanks to the hole that they put in it, and they got drunk and super ragey. In their anger, they drunkenly decided to start killing people and destroying the raft because they're all going to die anyway, right? So what's the point? So the drunks started hacking and slashing their way around. Some were trying to kill the men. Others went for the mast, which they did eventually cut down, and it was absolute chaos. One of the African battalion captains was hit when the mast fell, and the drunks set upon him, gouging his eyes out. Gross. Eventually, the drunks, turned now mutineers, were subdued, the mob controlled, things calmed down a little bit, but not before a whole lot of people were killed and some serious damage was done to the raft. There was a bit of this kind of chaos in the aftermath of the USS Indianapolis sinking as well, if you remember from that episode. It's just the chaos that comes with panic and rage and starvation and dehydration. It can lead you to do some truly wild things and or hallucinate. I like what Miles wrote about this in his book, quote, Horror Half dreams and hallucinations were merging the real with the imaginary, so that existence on the raft became an impossible kaleidoscope of fact and fiction. End quote. Luckily, I've never been in a situation where the dehydration, starvation, and chaos was so extreme that I hallucinated and then went into a murderous rage, or was victim to one. I'm glad most of us haven't been in that situation, but this just seems to be part and parcel for shipwrecks. When it's a survival situation, and there are a lot of people involved, it usually devolves into chaos. Can you imagine, though, what it was like for that one woman on board? She's there with her husband, too, so she's not, like, completely alone, but watching these drunken mutineers just slash everyone and try to destroy the whole ship? Can you imagine just looking over and seeing, like, Joaquin over there, destroying the only thing keeping everyone alive? Sheesh. So by the end of the rampage, 60 people were dead. Two barrels of water and two barrels of wine had been flung into the water, leaving only one barrel of wine left for the entire raft. Oh, and by the way, this chaos happened on the second day, and the raft wasn't found for another 10 days after that. On the third day, they tried fishing, but they weren't very successful, so they started getting desperate and were eating leather pouches or the grease that kept their hat sealed. One sailor almost ate some uh, excrement, but stopped himself right before he shoved it in his mouth. I guess they felt like they were at the eating leather stage, but not the poop eating stage. Day three, by the way, this was day three. I mean, listen, I would be starving too, but the lack of water is the more pressing issue rather than the lack of food. And then they looked to the pile of bodies heaped up in one corner of the raft. Now, Curiously, in that contemporary book I mentioned earlier by the German George Henrik von Langsdorff, the one that warned Europeans about African cannibals, he had also written that in times like these, when survival was at stake, it was acceptable to break the taboo of not eating human flesh in order to make it out alive. And the men on board the raft remembered that. And in fact, this exact situation has happened in half a dozen or more wrecks prior to the Medusa. Cannibalism, though normally taboo, was considered one of those things that had to happen to survive, at sea or on land. When there's no other food, and you'll die if you don't eat, then you eat. And at sea, when a wreck resorts to this, there's even a name for it, the custom of the sea. And while not specifically just about cannibalism, the custom of the sea are the rules that officers and crew follow in the open sea when maritime law doesn't apply. Cannibalism is part of that, and also drawing lots to decide who will be killed and eaten to help the others survive. I've got another episode in the, in the works lined up all about that. Coming out sometime later this year, it's pretty gross. And so, on the third day aboard this raft, 
Some of the survivors hacked the limbs off and ate the meat raw, pulled the skin away from the shoulder and the stomach and the thighs, gnawing away at it, and then scooping out the meat below it. Gross, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Not everyone did it first, though. Some weren't ready to consume their fellow man to survive. Yet. On the fourth day, they awoke to more deaths, another 10 or 12. All but one was buried at sea, so tossed into the depths, with one guy kept aside specifically to be eaten by the survivors. I'm not sure why they only saved one. I mean, I feel like at this point they've already crossed that line, and they've already consumed flesh, so why not keep more than one? I mean, yeah, it'll go off, but I, I don't know. One seems like a weird choice. Anyway. They managed to catch a few fish that day as well, so they decided to grill fish. And some human meat as well. It's a very stinky barbecue. But that was the last barbecue that they had, since in doing so they used up all of their supplies needed to start a fire, so the rest of the cannibalism had to be raw. And similarly to what we saw with the Andes plane crash, the raft survivors were to hang up strips, hang up strips of meat and flesh to dry in the sun to make it slightly more palatable. It's like making homemade human jerky. Another riot broke out overnight between the fourth and the fifth days, and after it was quelled and the rioters killed and or thrown overboard, there were only 30 survivors left of the original 147 after four to five days. There was one barrel of wine still left, so the 30 survivors calculated they could last probably four days on it while rationing. But of course, some of the men are going a little bit haywire, so two of them decided to drill a hole in the barrel and steal some wine for themselves, and they were killed for that crime. Things were getting progressively worse. What little supplies they had left needed to be rationed, but it was also becoming abundantly clear that some of the survivors were weaker than others, and they were going to die regardless. So, to hasten their seemingly inevitable deaths and try to prolong their own lives, the stronger threw the weaker overboard. The sole woman on board was one of the weaker people, and she, along with her husband, were murdered in that way. And after this organized murder, there were 15 survivors left. Soon enough, they did start to see some signs of the shore. First butterflies, and then a seagull. They had a small glimmer of hope. But things were still pretty bad. They were dying of thirst. Their tongues were swollen. Their lips were cracked. Some tried to drink urine just to keep their mouths wet enough. And as they edged closer and closer to shore, some supplies washed up to the raft. A single lemon almost caused more murders amongst the survivors, as they all wanted a taste of it. On the tenth day, a bunch of sharks surrounded the raft. And it wasn't just sharks, but also some Portuguese man of wars who have those crazy long stinging tentacles. They're not technically jellyfish, but they're related to jellyfish. Now, some of the men who were cooling off in the submerged part of the raft were stung so badly that it induced vomiting, fever, and stomach cramps. So man of wars are no, there's it's not like a regular jellyfish sting. It's a serious pain. I feel this things. I feel bad for them. Things are so bad. <laughs> they're, they're all dying off. They're committing murder. They're, they're consuming urine. And now they've got sharks surrounding them and they're getting stung by Portuguese man of war. Poor raft people. Now on the 12th day, right on the brink of death by starvation, exposure, dehydration, they saw a sail. At first, the sail disappeared into the distance and the survivors thought they were all doomed. But two hours later, it returned, and it was the Argus, one of their companion ships that was part of the original convoy. They were saved. The Argus, though it wasn't actively looking, just happened to stumble across the raft in just the nick of time to save them. The survivors had endured murder, drunken mutinous frenzies, stabbings, theft, cannibalism, starvation, dehydration, exposure, sharks, men of war stings, <laughs> drinking urine. But they had made it, and they were brought to the colony of St. Louis. Unfortunately, five died after the rescue. They weren't able to recover from the stress of survival on the raft. But ten men, including the surgeon who took charge on the first day, survived. So did the geographer, Coryard, who went on to co-write an incredibly successful book with the surgeon all about their experience. Was some of what happened exaggerated? Probably. 
But we also have a source from the captain of the Argus, who wrote to Governor Schmaltz about what he saw when he rescued the survivors. Quote, I found on this raft 15 people. They had been obliged to fight and kill a large number of their comrades who had revolted in order to seize the provisions. Others had been taken by the sea or died of hunger or madness. Those that I had rescued had fed themselves on human flesh for several days. And at the moment when I found them, the ropes which held the mast were covered with morsels of this flesh, which they had hung up to dry. The raft was also covered with scraps, which further attested to the food these men were obliged to consume. They had been sustained by a little wine, which they handled as carefully as possible. They still had several bottles when I found them. End quote. The super undeserving Captain Chamaray was interested in what happened to the Medusa, and more importantly, some gold that was on board the Medusa. So he sent a salvage crew to see what was still there. And you remember the 17 who stayed behind? Only three of them were left alive, 54 days later. Eventually, Chamaray was put on trial. He was tried on five counts of abandoning his men, failing to refloat the ship, abandoning the ship, incompetent and complacent navigation, and abandoning the Medusa before all the passengers were off the first. He was acquitted of the first three charges and found guilty on the last two, bad navigation, abandoning ship before the rest of the passengers. He should have been put to death for his crimes, but he was only given three years in jail, a product of being a loyalist. Because he was a stalwart bourbon follower, which is how he got that captaincy in the first place, the whole thing was covered up as much as possible and he was given a light sentence. No wonder political tensions were high when the monarchy does stuff like this, right? They put an incompetent captain in charge of a convoy of ships and when his incompetence leads to chaos that was the wreck of the Medusa and the tragedy that befell the raft, the whole thing is covered up so as not to make the Bourbons or the French monarchy look bad. And in the end, the 10 raft survivors did make it back home. And when Savine and Coryard's book was published, detailing the horrors of the customs of the sea, it did actually make some tangible, positive change. French military promotions were now to be done on merit, not on politics. Captains were to earn their position, not given it freely because of who they supported politically. It's just a shame that so many people had to die and be eaten for that change to happen. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the Medusa shipwreck. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. You can also support me and the show on Patreon. Just look up A Popular History of Unpopular Things, and you can also subscribe to my YouTube channel. Any kind of interaction really helps the channel grow, and I appreciate all the love and support. Be sure to follow my podcast, available wherever you listen, so you know when new episodes are dropped. And stay tuned to get a popular history of unpopular things.